In the previous episode, we introduced the selection optimization to propel our join implementation to a whole new level of performance. We concluded with the problem that even if we get the maximum performance out of such a simple function, the moment we start composing it with other functions to make more complex algorithms, we are introducing unnecessary intermediate types, and this hurts our performance. In this final episode of the high performance meta programming section, we will introduce a whole new way of writing meta functions that will bypass this problem and allow composition of meta functions without creating intermediate types. This in turn enables us to truly squeeze every bit of performance out of our meta programming, which, combined with the previously discussed optimization techniques, results in the fastest possible meta programs. The problem with normal functions or normal meta functions is that their input and output are not symmetric. What I mean by that is that a function can have multiple inputs with only one output. Take for example the transform function. In essence, it takes a number of inputs and transforms each of them using a given function. The core of the transform function takes a number of inputs that should be transformed and then returns the same number of outputs. Of course, a function can have only one output. So our transform function returns a list of types. But as we discussed in episode 10, creating these extra types is expensive in terms of compile time. So we want to prevent this as much as possible. Especially when we compose our transform with another function that operates on multiple inputs, we create a list only to unpack it again to continue processing its elements. That's a complete waste of computation time. So how do we modify our functions like this transform to allow them to pass multiple outputs to the next function without having to create intermediate types such as this list? To work around this problem, we need to move to a completely different programming paradigm. Instead of functions that take inputs and return an output, we are going to simply add an extra input to our function, namely the next function that should be called. It is then the job of the first function to call the next function with the process types as input. Now the transform function just forwards the parameter pack directly to the two pairs function, without having to create a list first. And we can of course chain this. Two pairs can also accept a function to call next. There are different names for this style of programming. There's tacit style, but in Haskell it's also referred to as point free. The most familiar type of tacit programming is on a terminal, where you use the pipe character to indicate which function should be called next. One nice thing about tacit programming is that you can actually read left to right. First, the transform unpacks some lists, then the output is passed to two pairs, which creates pairs and then passes them on to the next step function. This is different from the classic way of composing functions where we use nesting. As here, the most nested function executes first, and hence we are reading from right to left. So how do we apply this tested style programming to our meta programming? We have our function, and then a number of fixed parameters. In the case of our transform, this was the transformation function unpack list. Then we have the continuation, the next function that should be called. This was the two pairs function in our previous example. And lastly, we optionally have a variable number of parameters. We could, for example, use this for our inputs. But of course, the transform function itself is also a type that needs to be instantiated. And since the cost of a type instantiation is dependent on the number of parameters involved, it would be better if we can move those input parameters to an alias call in the body of the transform. If we write out the definition of such a transform function, it will look something like this. We accept both the transformation function as well as the continuation as type names. You might have expected these to be template template parameters. The reason we just use type names here is that we assume that these are lazy functions following the tested programming style and using a member alias to call for invocation. To be more concrete, just like the transform itself, they should offer an alias member f for function, which can be called with any needed parameters to invoke the meta function. In this case, we pass the input lists to f. Our transform function is implemented by simply calling function on each of the elements in the parameter pack expansion. In our previous implementations, we would now put this parameter pack in a list, but in the tested programming style, we immediately pass it to our continuation. Again, using the f alias template member to invoke this continuation. And that's all that's needed to rewrite our transform as a high performance tested style meta function. Well, almost. If you remember our episode on dependent names, you might have already realized that we have some ambiguity here that the compiler is going to trip over. 
We should indicate that the thing that is returned from calling these f members is a type using the type name keyword. Next, the compiler can't know whether these angled brackets are the start of a type list or a less than operator, as f is a dependent name. So let's also make that clear by adding the template keyword, so the compiler knows that it should expect a type list. This final form will now compile and give you blazing fast performance. It does not use any of its input to instantiate the transform template. This means that if you have already called transform with the same function and continuation before, calling it again will be a lightning fast memoize lookup, even if you have a completely different input to process. The actual processing of the input happens in the template alias call, which is much faster and doesn't involve any type instantiations. And when past the continuation, we can compose this transform with another function without instantiating any intermediate types. We can now also rewrite our join to the tested programming style. Again, it will accept the continuation, and the actual elements that are to be joined are passed to a member alias f. For our join f, we are going to use this join select based on the join size optimization, which we discussed in detail in the last episode. Modified for tested programming, this looks something like this. We call the correct join select specialization based on the output of join select size. Join select is going to merge all the input lists into one big parameter pack. At this point, we of course want to pass this parameter pack to the continuation without first having to package it in a list. So we've added the continuation function to join selects parameters, allowing it to immediately invoke it. If you want to dive into the details of how I've updated join select, I highly recommend that you check out the code on my GitHub. You'll find all the different implementations we've talked about on this series there. In the previous episodes, we've created and benchmarked various different remove if implementations. These implementations were all based on the composition of a transform and the join. For example, when we wanted to remove all floating point types, we would first call transform with a function that replaces floating point types with empty lists, while putting other types in a single element list. The join function would then merge all these lists in the final output list. With our new tested implementation, we can do the same thing, but now without creating any intermediate types. As a matter of fact, a tested style remove if should have both a parameter pack as input and pass one to the continuation. Let's see what it looks like. So at this point, we have our transform and our join, both taking parameter packs as input and passing their computed result directly to the continuation. This means that we can write our remove if as a call to transform with join passed as its continuation. But if we just want to call such remove if, or any tested style function for that matter, without composing it further, what continuation do we give to the last function? What continuation do we give to the join in this case? We need a way to terminate and convert the final parameter pack into something that can be returned. For this purpose, we introduce the lazy function listify. Listify is very simple. It simply takes the parameter pack that is passed to it and puts it in a type list. By passing listify to join, it will be called with the merged parameter pack and hence return the pack as a list. As a matter of fact, if you look at the code on GitHub, you'll find that I've adopted the convention of making listify the default continuation for meta functions. This allows us to just pass join without any parameters as the continuation of transform. Now let's write out the complete definition of remove if. Just like in implementations discussed in the previous episode, remove if is a template which takes a predicate as its first parameter. Here we will make the assumption that this predicate is a lazy predicate using a member alias called value for its invocation. We'll look at how to turn normal eager predicates into lazy predicates in a bit. Next, remove if accepts a continuation, which will default to listify. As we already said, we can implement the remove if by passing join as the continuation of the transform. For the transform function, we'll use a lazy variation of the wrap if not function introduced in the previous episode. This is the function that wraps elements in a list if they do not match the predicate, and otherwise just returns an empty list. If we would now compile the code, we'd find that remove if works as expected when called in isolation. Of course, if we would try to compose this remove if with other meta functions, we'd quickly realize that the continuation is never invoked. To fix this, we simply pass the continuation to join, completing our remove if implementation. Before we dive into the benchmarks of this new and improved remove if, let's take a look at creating a lazy predicate. The standard library offers us a whole range of eager predicates like the standard is floating point. 
They are eager because they do their computation the moment you instantiate them. This means we can't defer the potentially expensive operation until a point where we are sure we need it. A lazy variant would look something like this. The predicate itself can be instantiated and passed around the meta functions, just like you could pass a lambda or a function pointer at runtime. You could think of this as a meta closure. Only when the template member variable value is instantiated does the actual computation happen. Of course, it would be a shame if we would have to rewrite all the eager predicates from the standard library just to use them in our meta programs. So instead, we'll introduce a meta function to turn an eager predicate into a lazy predicate. To lazy predicate takes an eager predicate as input and then offers a value member that can be instantiated with the types you'd like to invoke the predicate on. Simple, but effective. For our benchmarks, we can now call our remove if with the to lazy predicate of standard is floating point. So let's see what that looks like. First, we'll run our experiment on 10,000 inputs. The two fastest implementations so far were the defaults and selection implementations. While the tested style implementation uses the same selection mechanism for its optimized join, it does not create any intermediate types and aggressively uses template aliases over template types whenever possible. This results in an algorithm that is three times faster than the selection algorithm. Of course, the difference only gets more extreme as we use a bigger input. When processing 50,000 types, we are already looking at 12 times better performance, truly making this final version worthy of the name High Performance Meta Programming. Finally, I let my computer run overnight to get some results for the other implementations we've discussed in the previous episodes and show you just how far we've come. I hope you enjoyed this episode and this section on High Performance Meta Programming. Let me know in the comments if you are interested in some bonus episodes where we apply these techniques to improve upon the standard library or whether you would like to see an episode where we take a deep dive into some third-party metaprogramming libraries. As always, you can find the code on GitHub. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.